District 40, Assembly of the State of California. And with the sponsor, of course, by Pacific High School. Welcome you. We'd like to welcome Mr. Mike Gallo from the school board here. Hi, everybody. We'd like to welcome Mr. Benito Barrios from our city council of San Bernardino. By the way, and I have to throw this in there, we're always happy to see him being a graduate of Pacific High School. <laughs> Very nice day. Yes. And it dates me to say that I was teaching while I was here as a student. Seems like yesterday. <laughs> Time flies. We'll leave that alone. We would also like to express our appreciation to our three candidates for the assembly, Assemblyman Mike, Mark Steinler. And one of our San Bernardino City Unified School District board members, Abigail Hill. We are going to jump right into it. Time is precious, I know, and thank you for both being here and taking time out of your schedule. Since you were not both present at the same time, I flipped the coin. Oh, so you know, and I even <laughs> called it. Okay. okay. And Miss Medina won. That uh, works okay. for me. Just so you know. So you will be going first, if that's okay. okay. And so what we're going to do, uh, real quick, I'll go over the rules real quick, is the students will ask a question. They've already have the questions on them. That, and the, uh, they will ask the question. You will each be given two minutes to uh, reply to that question. And then we'll move on. Um, we'll not be doing rebuttals today. Just stating our positions and going on to the next question. Okay. Thank you. Our first question comes from Imani, who I think is behind me, and she has a question about Inland Empire jobs. Hello, my name is Imani Bonham. Um, there are many jobs available <coughs> in the Inland Empire, but many are not qualified for these jobs and they're stuck in minimum wage positions. What are some steps that we could take to bring to bring local citizens into the 21st century job market? Well, that's a good question. Well, that's actually a really good question because we that's where the jobs are needed. We need to bring the jobs down here to the Illinois Empire, and I think that's one of the issues that we're not bringing the jobs. I know they're, they tend to be in the Bay Area and the other regions, but we need to make sure that the jobs are coming here. And minimum wage, unfortunately, it doesn't really, what it was before and what is currently right now, it's not enough to sustain a family. I mean, I, I used to work earning nine fifty an hour, and for a fact, you work full time, you're working hard, you're not gonna be able to sustain a family. And, and if you're able to uh, work full time, and you shouldn't be having to work and live in poverty either. So that's some of the things that we're gonna be fighting for is, is I do support the minimum wage, which is the $15 an hour, but it's also looking at career pathways, and, and what we're doing here in the district is one of those good things that we do have um, uh, 3D printing, we have different opportunities, nursing, education, and so forth. So this is those, those are some of the things I'm going to be pushing for. Great. Um, thank you. That's it is a great question, and frankly, it's a question that we're asking ourselves every single day. How are we able to provide a pathway for you to have a career in the 24, 21st century? And minimum wage really is, is a distraction. Minimum wage was intended to be a minimum wage, an entry level position. It was not meant to be the, the amount of money that you can raise a family on. That's not how it's supposed to work. We're, we're really focused when we talk about K through 12 education on your pathway to college. That's great. But there's not always a job at the end of the four years. There hasn't been. That contract has been severed. It has not been honored. We need to be looking back at shop classes. We need to be looking at how we can use our hands. Career and technical training so that we can work on industries where there is a career, where there is a job at the end of it, and we need to eliminate the stigma that goes along with that. We need to understand that there is honor in jobs where you can work with your hands, there is honor in professions where you can put food on the table for your families, and there is honor in being successful. There are industries in my district, we have Gerdau Steel, for example, where they are looking, they are starving for employees that are willing to work. 
that have a, a basic understanding of how to use their hands, a basic understanding of the mechanical nature of things, and those jobs pay sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year. Those are not minimum wage jobs. There are more industries in this region that are looking for young people that show a work ethic, that show a desire to work, and they will train you on what it is that they want you to do. But you need to have that desire, and the best way for us to do that is to give you the tools necessary to be able to develop and invest in career and technical training so that you understand that a four-year college degree is great. It's great for a lot of people, but it doesn't have to be the end all. And what we're seeing with young people is when they come out of four years, which really is six years, they're straddled with a tremendous amount of debt, and there's not a job there. We need to put investment dollars to follow where the careers are, and the careers need to be where there's jobs at the end of it. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Nathan Willett. Um, California is one of the least business-friendly states in the union with taxes and other state regulations. We have seen large corporations, for example, Toyota to Texas, leave our state. What would you propose that would stop the exodus and bring jobs to our area? Okay. Well, first of all, we already know that the state is in, in uh, we need to start improving the areas with um, keeping the small businesses and making sure that there's incentives to help them as well. And we're not doing a, a well enough job in the state of California. And one thing that I've even, even I have spoken with, uh, with a Speaker of the House and making sure that we start addressing the issues with our small businesses, our family owned businesses, and how we can help them with incentives, different incentives that currently the state does provide. Um, but even a few of them are going to be um, going to be expiring. So we also have to make sure that we bring those to our community here. Um, so I'm a private business owner. I, I own an advertising agency. I've owned this advertising agency for over 19 years. I started a small chain of pizza places 15 years ago as well. So I am that small business owner. And I am the small business voice in Sacramento. And I'll tell you right now, Sacramento has a war on local businesses. They are po passing policies that absolutely eviscerate the success for local businesses here. For example, the $15 minimum wage. That's not going to help any of us. What that's going to do is it's going to replace those entry level jobs with automation. Automation is the new industry that's booming in Silicon Valley. You're not going to have those opportunities to start your education and your work experience together because there won't be that opening for you. Now, Sacramento passes other policies that are very detrimental. They passed um, Assembly Bill 32, they call it cap and trade, which basically puts a cap on manufacturing here in California. They went ahead and renewed it this year with Senate Bill 32, which again, continues that cap on manufacturing. You say, well, what does that really mean? Well, it means that industries that were here in California that were providing those blue collar, very successful jobs, they can't do business in California. They can't, so they're moving out of California. And, you mentioned the comment about Toyota, but I mean, we have a great example recently of Ashley Furniture. Ashley Furniture in Colton was a manufacturing position where they had 800, 850 jobs. When they close down that factory, they're letting everybody go. They say they're going to reopen the factory in another state, and there's going to be 50 jobs. Where are the remaining 750? Automation. We have to really balance out the policies that are coming out of Sacramento because unfortunately Sacramento, they look at us and they don't look at us the way that we do. They look at everything as if we're Walmart. Local businesses cannot survive in that climate and I have been a voice and an advocate for local businesses to be able to make sure that you have that job opportunity. I started selling furniture when I came out of college. It was necessary. I need to do that, and I believe that we need to have those job opportunities for all of us to move forward. Hi, my name is Jennifer Ramirez. As a high school student, I'm really worried about the rising cost of college. Recently, the Los Angeles Unified School District reached an agreement with their community colleges in their district to provide free education for all LAUSD students who graduate. Would you work for something similar for our community college district? Okay, so this is a really great reason why it's nice to give us the questions in advance, because I, I needed to do a little bit of research on this question, because I, I was not familiar. 
But my understanding, um, to your point, is it comes from President Barack Obama's plan to be able to try and uh, really provide community college availability for, for most students. And I looked at the LAUSD situation, and they do provide one year of community college, and it's provided at business expense. Private business is paying for it, which, which I think is, is a great idea. And then I looked around, and I said, well, what other cities are doing this as well? Ontario has a program where they provide two years of community college that's paid for by private business, by the Chamber of Commerce, and by the County of San Bernardino. The other 23 states, I'm not, excuse me, the other 23 cities, I'm not familiar, but it, it, I'm, I'm okay with this. I am good with this. I believe that if the private sector wishes to go ahead and cover the cost of community college for an industry that they are trying to push people towards that particular profession, that makes sense. They're trying to grow employees. I think that's a great idea. Let's say that you're a medical industry. You need phlebotomists. Phlebotomists are the ones that take our blood. You need to go and get a two-year degree in community college to be able to learn phlebotomy. If you're then going to look for a career as a phlebotomist, I think absolutely having the medical sector cover the expense is a good investment for the private sector, and it's a good investment for you. So I think that those types of partnerships are successful for us, and I'd like to see more of them. One of the good things is that this is not a new concept. Back in the 70s, we were the top 10 funded um, in education, and actually we had good great achieve, um, student achievement during that time, back in the 70s. Now, and that, during that 70s, we actually had free community college. So many of our individuals had that opportunity. The problem is that um, now it feels like if it's, if, if it, you have to deserve it in the other sense, that you don't, you don't have to have free community college when back in the day, um, your grandparents or your parents received it. And so that needs to be addressed and we need to start looking at it that if you want to go to college, a two year or four year, it should be affordable first of all. And the second is community college should be able to be free. And we are in, and I actually applaud um, the Los Angeles for doing this, Los Angeles County for doing this because this is a great opportunity to help students learn and how they can help improve in, uh, for their future careers and being successful. So I completely agree and that's something I'll be pushing for. Hello, my name is Serena Solis. Many studies in recent years have shown the effects of marijuana on the brain development of youth. Plus the fastest growing demographics, demographic of marijuana users in the US is the 10 to 16 year old age group. What sort of legislation, legislation would you propose to help stem the growth of drug use in our state? The growth of the. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that question? What sort of legislation would you propose to help stem the growth of drug use in our state? What sort of legislation? Okay, that's great. Um, looking at right now, we have to work with those that are, are um, the experts in that area, and we can definitely be con contacting different types of organizations. We can communicate with our local police. We can um, connect with our, our uh, community leaders and making sure that they're able to address some of the issues that pertains to that. Um, and then of course in, in Sacramento to make sure that we start addressing that piece. So I would have to get more information. I, again, I'm going to echo what I said earlier. I, I think that we're constantly putting more on law enforcement. We are expecting law enforcement to deal with, with more, and we, our expectations are higher, and we're providing them less in resources on a regular basis. And I'll tell you straight away, government is not the answer. Government is not the answer. Generally, what comes out of Sacramento does not benefit us. It's a one-size-fits-all, and they don't think about our community the way that they think about the Bay Area and the coastal areas. And I think, frankly, the root of this is parenting. I don't know that this is a government issue as much as it's a parenting issue. I, I have a daughter, she's 16, I have a son who's eight. I've had the conversations about the impacts of drugs on both of them. I understand that my role as their father is probably the most influential in making sure that they're on the, the right path. And I think that all of us need to really focus on personal accountability and personal responsibility and not look towards government with legislation. 
as we already stated before in the last question, you know, a lot of these behaviors are occurring and there's legislation that says it's illegal already. So we need to focus on restoring the value and the relationship between the kids and their parents and really emphasize the parenting role. Thank you. Hi, my name is Luz Fabio, and one of our founding fathers' basic principles was religious freedom. While much progress has been made on LGBTQ rights, how do you balance demands for fairness with freedom of religion? Our religions are denounced, uh, are denounced as bigoted or biased if they speak out against alternative lifestyles. Aren't religious congregations also protected by the First Amendment? And actually, yeah, you're right. The American, um, all Americans are protected by the First Amendment. And when you look at churches, actually my, myself and my family attend the same congregations, Emmanuel Baptist Church. And one of the things is that you do, and, and you do have to accept that everyone has the right to freedom of speech. Um, the thing is that we also also have to abide the law. And right now the law is that, um, you know, we have to accept the gay marriage piece in the sense that you, you treat individuals with respect, with dignity and respect, but you also have to make sure that you don't discriminate against race, against ethnicity, and, and of course sexual orientation. We shouldn't have to be um, telling someone who they, who, they, who they can love and who they can't love. So that's one of my points is that I know God is very merciful and, um, and we also know that we also have to fight by the law. Um, this, is a, this is a difficult question. It's sensationalized on the national level. It's something that we, we hear spoken about quite often. And, you know, I, I'm a business owner, as I've already stated. I, I personally um, really don't have as much of a, a concern about this particular issue. I, I'm a Christian also. And I look at the LGBTQ movement, and they have made tremendous strides in just one generation. One generation. If you think back, I mean, I'm 46 years old. If I go back to the TV show Will and Grace, that was considered revolutionary at the time, and now it's kind of passe. And that's all happened in your generation. So I would say to the LGBTQ community, there has been tremendous strides, but the religious community feel that those tremendous strides have been at their expense, at their rights, at their beliefs. And those are deeply held beliefs. So I would just caution balance. Balance and patience. Tremendous strides cause tremendous waves. It takes time to let those waves calm down. And then you can see where it settles and where everyone will be able to be really respectful of each other and of each other's choices in life. Thank you. My name is Soyla Ramos, and my question is, my parents are immigrants to the United States. They have spent a lifetime working on building a better life for their children. Now with your talk of building laws and rounding up immigrants, what is your stance on immigration and a path to citizenship? I'm just gonna make sure we don't trip anyone on this cord. <laughs> so again, another topic that is absolutely sensationalized in the national news. And um, you know, I, I personally believe in immigration. This country was founded on immigration. My wife was born in Mexico. She moved here when she was three. She naturalized when she was 18. So I, I am a family of immigrants, as it were, but we all are. Every one of us has, has someone in our family that immigrated here to the United States. When we talk about immigration and the sensational part, we speak only about the southern border, and, and that's not the whole complex issue of immigration. There are complexities to the immigration law that need to be ironed out so that it's fair for everybody. And I'll give an example that most people don't think about. Did you know that if you come from Korea and you purchase a business in the United States, you are on a fast track to citizenship? Did you know that if you're from the Philippines and you purchase a business, the same business in the United States? Back of the line. There's, there's a, a imbalance there we need to really look at it from a full comprehensive approach to immigration reform. Not only focus on the sensational aspects that people are divided on, because that's easy. It's easy to say you're right and I'm wrong. What's hard is to ad address the real root of the policy and really look at it from an honest perspective. Instead of trying to 
throw a bomb from one side or another. It's, it's easy to make an enemy. It's harder to make a friend. And I think on the immigration argument, we need to all realize that we're here together. We're here together and we want to be successful together because this country was founded by immigrants and we are all diverse in the things that we bring to this country and we can all be successful together. We just need to come up with a balanced, comprehensive reform approach. And I'm an advocate for that. Well, the thing is that when my parents came down in um, the United States, they came for better, for better opportunities. And fortunately, um, they had to work really hard. They had to work really hard. They actually went to, my mom was working as a cleaning lady in one of the houses and making sure that that's how she was able to make ends meet. But during that time, it was very difficult. There wasn't that many opportunities. And so now, as my, since my parents are those that uh, were working class um, immigrant families, my husband who came from Mexico as well, an immigrant. So there's the thing is that we, we are here to try to look for opportunities. Families are here to look for opportunities on how they can help make their own family, how they can support their own family. And we should look at opportunities and making sure that we provide that. And um, so that's where I'm gonna be coming from and I'm gonna be pushing forward for immigrant immigration in the stance that we provide those type of opportunities. If they wanna be successful, we're gonna make sure that they are. Thank you. My name is Anna Ortega, and my question has to do with the refugees. So Hillary Clinton, the Democratic Party nominee for President of the United States, has proposed that we accept thousands of refugees from Syria into the U.S. How do you propose we handle the situation in California, both from a humanitarian and a public security position? If you haven't seen the pictures and the videos already of the children that are dying every single day and the families that are being devastated in Syria, I mean, it, our country is founded on, on, on helping others. And we have to make sure that we are not excluded in that. Other first world countries are doing the same thing, so we wouldn't be the only ones that would be helping the Syrian and the refugees. The, the things that we do need to make sure is that we're screening, of course. We're doing adequate screening. But at the same time, we, sh we were founded in making sure that we were gonna help those that are helpless. And um, so that's something that we're gonna be addressing, but I know that what, regarding uh, the screening piece, we could look to uh, Congress and making sure that they are uh, being accountable as well. I, I'm, I'm wholly sympathetic to the situation in Syria. I, I think we've all seen the news, we've seen the photos. It, it, it hurts, but I, I believe that we have a responsibility to the safety of our own country and to our own people first. And I think that we have not proven that we have a vetting process that is, that is foolproof. And I am afraid, especially in the wake of, of terrorist attacks that we've seen on the United States soil, that, that we are trying too hard too soon without knowing how well to do it best. And I really would like to look at the countries surrounding Syria to absorb more of the refugees than what we're seeing coming to the United States. I believe that we need to protect our citizens first and foremost. Good morning, um, my name is Erica Reyes, and my question is, recently a sheriff's officer from LA County was ambushed and executed by a recent parolee that was released early for good behavior. Proposition 57 asks for the people to vote on extending that program. What is your position on releasing nonviolent felons early? Um, Proposition 57, first of all, I mean, it's a tragedy and we should never um, condone any type of that kind of behavior regarding the police officer. And I do, I'm sorry that he had to um, go through that. But the thing is that we also have to make sure that um, the inequities with regarding who are being incarcerated are being addressed as well. Now, Proposition 47, 57 is one of those sensitive um, subjects and we have to make sure that it's not gonna impact us in a huge way, but uh, but we are ha but we also have to be accountable for those that are, are trying to make a better living. They're trying to make um, have better opportunities, and so that's something I'll be looking at. Thank you. I appreciate the extra moment. I wanted to pull out a list. I I first want to say I'm absolutely opposed to Proposition 57. I think it's a terrible idea. Effectively, what Proposition 57 does is it eliminates the district attorneys, the courts, and the judges 
from sentencing guidelines and allows the Department of Corrections to arbitrarily choose and reduce sentences for felons, violent felons, I would consider, and I'll read you a list, that are incarcerated in jail right now. They want to release more of them onto our streets. Now, they're categorizing it in the media, saying that they are nonviolent, and they gave a list of what they consider to be violent offenses. I have a list of what they don't consider to be violent offenses. Rape by intoxication, rape of an unconscious person, person, human trafficking involving sex acts with minors, drive-by shooting, rape with a deadly, excuse me, assault with a deadly weapon, taking a hostage, domestic violence involving trauma, possession of a bomb or a weapon of mass destruction, hate crime causing physical injury, arson causing great bodily injury, discharging a firearm on school property, corporal injury to a child, false imprisonment of an elderly person, and this is just a partial list of what they consider to be nonviolent offenses. I, I can't support that in any way. I can't support AB 109. I can't support Prop 47. We have seen prisoners that have been moved because of AB 109 into our jails and then summarily released onto our streets. We have seen a spike in crime in our neighborhoods because of these felons that have been released. And it's, it's offensive to me. It's offensive to me that we are seeing so many prisoners being moved out and we're doing it under the guise of rehabilitation, but we're not providing them jobs because we're already talking about the challenges of jobs in the community as it is. So what are they doing? They're going back to their old ways and we can't be victimized anymore. I vote no on Proposition 57. Hi, my name is Anthony, um, and my question is, what can you do as a candidate for public office to change political campaigns from a negative and divisive and divisive to positive and community building? The follow-up to that question is, are you willing to set a positive tone in the final few weeks of this campaign? Would you like me to answer the follow-up in addition to the first yeah, one? Yes. Okay, all right. So I... I, I thank you for the question. I, I believe that I have run a very positive campaign. I believe that I have spoken about the issues that matter in our community and what I've done and what I will continue to do as your state assemblyman. But I gotta tell you what's at stake. What's at stake in this race? The balance of power in California is at stake. <laughs> Sacramento wants to replace me because I refused to raise your gasoline tax by up to 76 cents per gallon. They pushed it this year. They also want to eliminate Proposition 13, which would skyrocket property taxes, which would be passed on to the consumers. <coughs> understand this is a school? I totally understand. And you've got two more coming in four minutes. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> okay, hopefully I'm done in those four minutes because I got two questions. <coughs> um, so, so, you know, I. I think we have to recognize that Sacramento is doing everything they can to be able to buy this election. They are. They, they are focused on trying to, you know, really smear me as if I am Donald Trump. And frankly, Donald Trump makes it easy because he says some really dumb things and it allows the campaigns to really not have to talk about their candidate at all. All they have to do is try and slam me. And that's not fair, and that's not reasonable. I have focused on the positives. I will continue to focus on the positives, but you need to understand what's at stake. They want someone that will vote for the 76 cent gas tax increase. So they chose someone. They want someone that will eviscerate Proposition 13. So they chose someone. They want someone that is not beholden to their district, but is owned by them. So they chose someone. I'm not owned by anyone. I vote my conscience. I vote my district. I am accessible. I am accountable. I put my cell phone number, my cell phone number out. I get crazy phone calls at 4 a.m. I let those go. But majority of the times, they're real people that have real questions. And my job as your assembly member is to be available to answer your questions and then ultimately be held accountable <coughs> for every single vote that I take. So I believe that accessibility and accountability are the hallmarks of elected office. I'm a business owner. I've been a business owner for a tremendously long time. I don't need this job. 
I have been very successful in my life and I will continue to be successful, but I believe that this community needs a voice that is independent and understands what it takes to be successful for you. Because your future is, is what it's at stake. It's not my future, it's yours. And I have sacrificed my relationships with, with my business, a lot of the time with my family, to be able to make sure that I am there for you. And Sacramento doesn't like it. They want someone that's a puppet, and I won't be that person. Okay, well, I'm, uh, first of all, let me give you a little background about myself. I went through 14 different schools. I was in foster youth. I lived in Mexico another year. And regardless of the situation I grew up in, my parents wanted the best for me. And they told me, you're gonna go to college, Abigail, you're gonna go to college. And I says, yes, I am. But guess what? And the education system doesn't always work for everyone. I was uh, taking extra classes. They told me, Abigail, here are the classes you're gonna pick and you get to pick which one. I wanted to become an artist, and there was only auto shop left over. So I took auto shop, I learned how to change shocks. And so the reality is that when you have a voice, when you have someone that's representing you in a different level, um, unfortunately, when I did community organizing, I was advocating for us, nobody, um, there were certain, several groups um, that represent us in Sacramento that wasn't paying attention. We were addressing the issues with education, making sure there was more money for our schools, and guess what happened? We had legislators and my opponent also against the funding for education, which was Proposition 30. If we didn't have that money for our schools to make sure that we brought in AVID, this is one of the demonstration schools here, we brought in money, more money for AVID, not only in high school, but in elementary school. And so when, when you look at the issues that pertain for our schools, and if we didn't have all that money, we were able to bring back our teachers, we were able to bring sports, music and arts. All of that would have been diminished if we didn't look at the issues with those propositions. And you know what's happening now? He's also against Proposition 55, which will continue the money model. And so all of these issues are happening. I'm, I'm the mom. I have five children, two at, two at the high school at Sanji. I know it's across the way. But honestly, I have my kids here. You guys go through lockdowns, right? Who's paying attention? My kids go through lock time, lockdown all the time. But what happens is when you have individuals over there in a separate city that doesn't really understand and come in, it wasn't until I decided to run and people asked me, Abigail, we need a voice. We need someone to come down and help us. Who's coming down? And me as a parent, you know what? Running for office was so difficult. But I asked my husband, you know, and I asked my kids, we, is this something for us? And they says, you know what? Nobody's having a voice for us in our community. Yes, we need to have it. And yes, it's not easy. But at the same time, when you look at the campaigning portion, the negative pieces of it, it's terrible. I'm that mom that didn't want to get into all of that. But what happens is that when you're pushed against the wall and when you're, when you're realizing that, all of these negative things are happening from both of us. He's attacking me, I'm attacking him. But you know what? It's because of the negative campaigning piece that they think that this is the way to win. Now the thing is that with Sacramento, I'm not going up there to represent, to make sure that we're passing all these other things. You know what? I'm making sure that our women are having equal pay, that our farm workers are, are being paid what's right over time. If you work over time, you should be paid over time. Looking at issues pertaining to women, to, to our families. But the thing is that that's why I was asked to run. Not to try to be this puppet, as he said I was going to be. It wasn't. It was to look at who's going to finally represent us here. And, uh, and I honestly, I will tell him, and hopefully he can follow the suit with me. I will go anti-anything negative. He's, he's willing to tell those that do the independent expenditures are hundreds of thousand dollars to put attack ads on me. I would, I would definitely, right now, if you want to join me, we can do it. I will not do any more attack ads because I don't like it. But you have to also make sure that all those that support you and in, in spending hundreds of thousands of dollars will stop it too. We do have time now for a two minute closing statement. Okay, chance to wrap up uh, what you would like to say to the students and our guests and uh, then I will do a closing thing after that. 
Well, and first I wanted to say thank you to Pacific High School and for you students for putting these questions together. This has been a, a, a good debate. It's a, it's a nice opportunity for us to be able to really see the differences between the two candidates and the different perspectives that we bring to the office and the different, really the futures that we're trying to outline for you. And, and I, I'd like to just point out, you know, I've, I, I've been a consensus builder. I have been effective. It's been an honor and a privilege serving as your state assembly member. And, and I've been endorsed by every single mayor and every single city council member in every single city that I represent. And I represent the cities of Rancho Cucamonga, Redlands, Highland, Loma Linda, San Bernardino, Mentone, Devore, and Lytle Creek. That's a lot of people. And the reason they support me is because I am not a bomb thrower. I am doing what's in the best interest of all of us, every member of our community. That's why I've been endorsed by education leaders from across the 40th Assembly District, including our own Mike Gallo. I, I have been endorsed by all of law enforcement and business leaders. They all understand that they need a voice that understands what's necessary in this community. I'm from here. I grew up here. I went to Belvedere. I went to Serrano. I went to Aquinas. You know, this is where my home is too. And I understand this community very well. But there's a lot at stake in this race. There's a lot at stake. And the balance of power in California is a reason that there's been over $3 million spent on one side, and there's probably going to be spent maybe $10 million in total in this race. That's an obnoxious amount of money to be spent on an assembly seat. But Sacramento wants complete control. They don't want to share. They don't want balance. They don't like the idea of a checks and balances between the two parties. They want absolute control. And if I lose this seat, it's 100% controlled by one party in all of Sacramento. And that is not good for our community. That is not what the framers were looking for. That is not what is in the best interest for all of us. So I've been fighting. I have been everywhere I possibly can be. I have held community coffees. I've had job fairs. I've had veterans resource fairs. I've been at city council meetings. I've even paid for hosting um, the adoption of over 400 plus animals at our local shelters. I think that you need a legislator that is accessible and accountable. My name is Mark Steinorth. I ask for your vote on November 8th. Thank you. Well, first of all, I wanna thank you all for the opportunity. Um, this, is, this is really good to see students active in the political system. I remember when I was younger, um, and my parents uh, didn't, didn't uh, weren't able to vote. And the problem was that uh, we saw the election from an outside perspective and we, we didn't really understand the system. But one thing that I do value is the fact that many of you guys are looking at it at an earlier age. And I think what happens with the political world, because now that I'm learning about it, is that there's so many people, um, especially low-income minority families that are never contacted um, by legislators. You know where I'm walking? I'm walking in off of Waterman, not Waterman, it's east of Waterman. I'm also <coughs> on Highland and uh, East Street, G Street. There's these areas that are hard hit and you know what's happening? It's like, Abigail, I never had anyone come to my door. Abigail, there's finally someone telling us we can definitely vote because what happens is that there's a system within the voting piece that not everybody's contacted. You know why? And I didn't understand because they're high propensity voters. People who vote in high numbers, um, they're the ones that are contacted. So if you're a low propensity voter, you're low number, well, we're not gonna invest money in your camp to, to reach you. We wanna make sure we only reach those that are voting consistently. And I'm thinking, no, I was one of those. I wanna make sure that I reach out to every single one that can vote because we wanna send a message that your voice does count. But what happens is that it doesn't always happen that way. In my campaign, we try to make sure, I've been walking six days a week, connecting with the voters. That's easy for me because I don't mind going to these hard hit neighborhoods, into our, our areas of San Bernardino that nobody else wants to walk into. I'm walking, I'm walking in areas in Redlands that nobody wants to walk into. I'm walking in areas of Highland, close to where the 12 year old boy that was shot and killed at the liquor store and was killed. I'm walking in those neighborhoods, but you know what? I'm doing it because I know that your voice can count. I know that your voice is important to me, and that when I go to Sacramento, I will make sure I take that voice 
and, and represent you in Sacramento, your families, the issues that's pertaining to here. And I will continue that fight. We'd like to thank our candidates. Please show them our, our appreciation.